thank you, Meta, um, and thanks to Science for Peace for inviting me to finish off their lecture series, uh, which until now has been at a very high level of uh, distinguished uh, lectures. Uh, the uh, subject, of course, is the family, and uh, okay, well, that's good. All right. Uh, I've got an outline here. So uh, the point of the uh, talk is that we're going to first look at official uh, photographs of uh, conflict, war, um, and uh, what that means to the state. And the way it's, uh, those images are reproduced in the uh, main discourse, in the uh, newspapers and how stories are told about that. Uh, then I want to get in a bit into the theory of family photography and visual sociology, as uh, Meta has uh, implied, is something uh, quite new. And uh, the nice thing about the International Visual Sociology Association is that it has an annual conference this year in Greece uh, in June, and that makes it a very valuable association to belong to. But there is a lot of work now happening up till uh, very recently the uh, fine arts people have been in charge of photographs and looking at them and trying to make sense out of them. Uh, increasingly, I think social, sociologists are uh, moving into this fertile field and trying to analyze family photographs in a different way. Uh, if we are, as I think just about everybody in this room has been, a uh, subject in a family photograph, uh, then uh, we have to consider how we're posing, how we present ourselves to others. And of course, not every time is a good time. Sometimes the uh, subjects of the photograph uh, for reasons I'll make clear, I hope, are uh, having to look good even though times are bad. And the last thing is that, of course, the official record is uh, almost always misleading. Uh, what they try to do is repress the combined family uh, photograph uh, album and the collective albums that people get. So we'll look at, finally, family memories about what really happened. Okay, so uh, first we're going to start with images of war and conflict from the official point of view. And this is, uh, we'll start with recruiting. These are recruitment posters from World War I. Uh, this is my favorite. Women in Britain say go. Uh, it's happened to me, but uh, I get, <laughs> thank you very much. We finally got a laugh out of this crowd. I thought, thought you'd all dozed off. Okay, uh, so uh, you got a great photo, a great image. You've got the uh, mother, uh, older daughter, little son, and in the background, which will be difficult to see, you've got the soldiers, including husband of this family, marching off to war. It's a glorious thing. Uh, here we've got uh, the uh, signs of masculinity even more. You go to fight for dear old mom, you're the man, uh, and you're fighting for this abstract. Uh, justice. As many of these posters uh, as possible are from Canadian sources. Uh, this was one uh, from Montreal um, and uh, it's calling on every son of Israel to do his duty. 
You've got the British soldier uh, scissoring the uh, Jewish man out of his uh, bindings so he can go off and fight with those people running in the distance. And then they've got these uh, lords uh, up on top, and I'm not sure what they are uh, doing at all. But uh, there were appeals last slide to the Irish, now to the Jews, and of course to women. Now, I looked at this first and I thought, this woman is supposed to defend the country with that spatula. <laughs> But uh, that's not the case. She's supposed to be a female who does uh, the uh, recipes on a strict budget. She's one of Canada's house soldiers. I like that one uh, because it makes uh, the uh, uh, gender issue very, very clear. And war is often based on appeals to masculinity, and of course, uh, women pushing their husbands out of the house to war uh, and doing well on the home front. Uh, the image of battle is glorified in these official uh, photos and these official banners. You've got, uh, uh, this is from the US, it uh, looks pretty great to be out there. Nothing is going to stop you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, heroism. I'm counterpointing these with a couple of battle soldiers. Here are French soldiers. Uh, it's from uh, about 1914 or so. So the uh, images are somewhat fuzzy. But if you look at them closely, you can see uh, young men being blown up, not shown in the posters, but in the actual photos. On the other side, uh, here's a big explosion, German soldier diving for cover. Not a place uh, most of us would want to be. Uh, but triumph. Uh, here we have the much, much posed uh, raising the flag on Iwo Jima, uh, famous um, American photograph of Triumph, the taking of Iwo Jima. And as I said, they worked this out several times. It's not the original soldiers who were in the first one, but the flag got uh, raised and it's Triumph. Uh, this one also on uh, VJ Day, I think, in, uh, uh, in uh, New York City. Uh, it's an iconic uh, picture. There's a statue of it down in Sarasota. And uh, they interviewed some of the women who might have been in the photo later on, and they complained about being grabbed and sexually assaulted. So this is a famous photo of what seemed to be triumph, because the guy got to grab some girl and squeeze her and kiss her. But we can reinterpret this triumph in a different uh, way right now. So after the triumph, uh, we've got what we had here in Canada recently, the uh, Remembrance Day. Uh, here, soldiers are honored. Uh, the real war is not shown. It's a romanticized thing. Uh, uniforms, uh, purple wreaths. And uh, of course, uh, the veterans need and should have uh, some respect and veneration, which has not been happening in our country. Uh, but this is uh, one of the ways that we do recognize them. Uh, this is another way. Uh, you notice the child is now dressed in military uniform. He's clutching the flag that represents a dead Canadian soldier. I've subtitled this, if you can see it, child abuse, because I think indoctrinating children into warfare uniforms, a death, is uh, not exactly what uh, I think we should be uh, doing in this country. But in any case, that's the triumphalist stuff. Last couple of slides from the newspapers. 
uh, and the rest from different sources. Now I want to get into the question of images of families. Uh, and uh, what I want to say about families uh, is as follows. This is uh, towards the end of the 19th century. It's in eastern Georgia in Europe. Uh, it's a wedding. And what we've got here is a collectivity. And all the people in the photo are part of the uh, collective. So they can look at the photo and say, well, I'm part of this much uh, larger group. I'm not an anonymous, uh, anomic person. I'm uh, in some kind of much larger world. Uh, I relate to other people. Uh, we have important attributes of identity from the photo. We have social support. We have family bonds. And these, of course, as we know in sociology, are social assets. Uh, they're associated statistically and in every other way uh, with a sense of well-being. Now, this is a similar photo from Mexico, also at about the same time. And um, we can see that there's a remarkable similarity from that day until this of uh, family photographs. Uh, what we're being presented with, of course, also are images of social and biological reproduction that we're not uh, these are people, and there's an older woman, and there's a much younger person who's a child of the kind of middle category. And so what the family photograph does is it celebrates uh, this uh, reproduction. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, it's a collectivity. It's good to be part of it. The family, show, family photo shows well-being. On the other hand, it's a celebration of heterosexual reproduction. And um, we'll move on to this family, which is another one, maybe from a little later time, given the quality of the photograph. It's also from Eastern Europe. The uh, analysis, the complaint uh, made by one scholar in this area, uh, an archivist uh, by the name of Logan Sisley, is that the family photograph has, uh, and I'll quote him, traditionally been mortgaged to heterosexual reproduction. Now, we don't see people having sex in the photograph, which may be a very good thing, uh, but what is there is that the having of sex is celebrated. Uh, and as a gay man, of course, what he sees in parents' eyes is what he calls the parental fantasy of reproduction. Uh, that that becomes a kind of normative uh, expectation uh, that your son will get married and have uh, children which, uh, of course, we know some uh, proportion of young men and young women are not uh, up to. Here's a, a whoops, what happened here? OK, uh, so uh, this is the counterpoint to that. That's the uh, modern family to mothers. We know lots of families like this. So we can say that the uh, family is having uh, a, a transition in our time. Uh, it's not just based now on uh, heterosexual reproduction, but on all kinds of different family forms. Uh, and we are moving, as Sisley himself points out, we are moving out of uh, our uh, rigid expectations about family and family life that had been with us for, I think, somewhat more than a century. I date the um, 
family photograph the last half of the 19th century. The so-called traditional family, the one we think of has been with us eternally, also emerged in the last half of the 19th century. And I think the family photograph enables the actual uh, real life family. Uh, it provides images, it provides role models, it provides something to uh, try to uh, present to the world, and uh, the uh, family itself is keen to uh, do that. Uh, here's the uh, Mennonite family, and uh, there is actually, uh, this is uh, Donna Gannon, a friend of ours from Florida, and she gave me or sent me this photograph. Uh, they were uh, Mennonites. Um, Donna's dad took the photo, uh, and when I asked Donna about it, uh, she said there's only one true believer at this table, and that's... Um, That, uh, that's that woman right there. The uh, strength, of course, and uh, showing of uh, power is in being able to get people together because it's a terrific achievement. Uh, there is, uh, for uh, philosophers in the audience, there is a uh, French philosopher, Pierre Bourdieu, who was uh, one of the first, and the first famously, to theorize the family album. And uh, what he wrote was that if you can get people to show up uh, in a collectivity, uh, this will help demonstrate that uh, the members are integrated, uh, getting together to do the photograph, does uh, develop bonds. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, how's your hangnail? You know, that kind of thing. And um, it's uh, an important uh, issue. Also the question, who arranges the photograph? Who gets it together? So in Donna's case, it's the unmarried daughter. Uh, the rest of them had deserted the faith quite a while ago, but they showed up uh, for the photograph. Uh, what we can see here, this is some cute kids, um, is that the family is, the family uh, is not just a biological reproduction, I take it, that's dad in the uh, particularly jazzy outfit. This is of course a clan family. Uh, there's mom in the white thing, the taller person, and then the two sweet little kids. So not only do we see that this family is together, but we know that the little kids are uh, being inculcated into this uh, particularly odious uh, fraternity of racists and cross burners. The uh, issue is, of course, we all uh, socialized children, if we have them, uh, but uh, not so dramatically, I think. And uh, not everybody grows up in families. There's a wonderful uh, photographer, just still in his late 20s, Rob Woodcox. And what he does is what many photographers do. He poses the people in the photograph, and his uh, momentous stuff is on foster children. He himself was a foster child. He wants the photograph to reflect the uh, way the foster child feels, particularly in a transitional time. So uh, not every one of us, of course, is incorporated into a family of origin. There's lots of stuff that happens to people, uh, especially with ch children. It's not of their doing or volition. And this, I think, captures the 
uh, idea people, just young people, uh, just apprehensive. He also, as his subjects, only uses foster children, by the way, and they seem to have the uh, perspective pretty well. Now, um, what uh, we can think of now is interrogating the family photograph. You've got a family photograph. We've got lots on our, our walls at home. And uh, we have to ask questions of it. And usually people in the photograph uh, want to look uh, normal. So uh, this is what you see. You're the outsider. You probably never, except for the, are there just two of us in the room who are in this photo? Uh, but uh, this was a family photograph about late 80s somebody's backyard. So you see a you know, group of aging people, uh, middle-aged people, and young children. And that's what you would see out of it. And uh, when I gave a version of this talk some time ago, uh, somebody came up to me and said, look, uh, we've got exactly that photograph. Somebody grew up in a different country and under different circumstances. So there's a formality, a resemblance, a routinization of the family photograph. Uh, in any case, you see a lot of people in the summer in the backyard in Windsor, Ontario. But we scrutinize the photograph. We ask questions of it. And this is the answer that I got. This is, must really be my family. Um, and uh, you saw those other people, but I'm sure I lived at Downton Abbey for a while, and uh, must, that must be the story. And I thought sometimes that uh, what I should do with the family album, in, in our case, is just go to a yard sale and some aristocratic family, buy up their photos, uh, you could reestablish an identity uh, pretty uh, smartly, I think. This is not serious, folks. Uh, right, there you are. OK. Uh, now, here we have the normal. I'll show you uh, some slides of normal families. This is a normal, healthy family. This is from an ad for Luxury Club, a resort somewhere where they have sandy beaches. This is uh, another jumping family. I think photographers must be getting seasick with all this jumping. Uh, but this is very, very popular. If you look on uh, Flickr for jumping families, you'll find lots of them. Uh, this is also a normal family. This is a Christmas card from the Scottsdale, Arizona Gun Club. And uh, I chose this photo because Santa's holding the baby. Uh, in the other families, he's hold, also holding an AK-47. Uh, and we have a certain reaction to this, or I did when I saw it. Uh, this is not a Toronto family. Uh, this is not. Uh, any sensibility to which I subscribe, but if you were in Scottsdale, Arizona, you'd go down to the gun club, so the, if you're a member, I guess, and get a season's greetings with Santa and all the guns and rifles. Um, interesting uh, question. Now, Here's a photo that I paid for, uh, for Memoirs Publications. Uh, this man is the grandpa-looking guy, uh, is a model. He's probably uh, has as many photos up in the internet as Kim Kardashian. He's in, all, he's in all of these photographs. It's a wonderful, appealing thing cuddling with these two girls, reading them a story. Uh, it's uh, a stock family image, but uh, for just a few bucks, uh, you can uh, buy it. 
And this is your normal impoverished family. Uh, this is from Appalachia. It's from Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, uh, taken by Walker Evans, the great photographer of Appalachia in the 40, 40s. And I misread this photo for many, many years. Uh, it was done as part of an agenda to raise consciousness and get uh, the United States interested in helping its poorest people. And I wondered for a long time why these people uh, posed. But of course, just as with Downton Abbey or any other family, they're posing here uh, because they are showing what every other family photograph shows. They're showing connectivity, reproduction, they're uh, not living uh, with any means to speak of. Uh, they don't have money for clothes and they don't look like they're uh, eating particularly richly. But they are a family and if you look at the Appalachian photos, uh, miners, families, uh, from uh, all of the decades, you'll see that the family issue, the way people present themselves to the camera, is very revealing of how they feel they should, uh, they should present themselves within their limits. So Walker Evans, in a sense, gave some legitimacy uh, to this family. Uh, and they are, uh, as far as I can tell, quite connected. Uh, and of course, we don't have uh, families where everybody's healthy or everybody's looking uh, good. This is a family, they uh, have a disabled child, and uh, still, they're in the family photograph. Um, they're on display. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, remarkable. Now, uh, what we want to look at is uh, the family in normal times, in abnormal times. The normal, trying to look normal in abnormal times. Uh, when we do family photographs, we show up uh, usually with reasonably nice clothing. Uh, if there's a crying baby, we don't uh, have, we calm down the baby. You don't see family photographs of uh, crying babies. If I have a stain on my shirt, I change my shirt. We want to look good because we're projecting forward in ways that uh, I'll uh, make clear, I think, because as soon as you snap that photo, as soon as the shutter clicks, it's an historic document. You're now talking uh, not just to the people there, but you're projecting forward. How do I want to be seen in the next generation? And it's particularly difficult if you've had uh, a normal, what was for the time and place, a normal family life. And then times are difficult and you're uh, having to present yourself and you want to present yourself in the future as uh, some family that had its, uh, had togetherness and all the things we've been talking about. This uh, is a British uh, family from the uh, Imperial War Museum collection. There uh, is an interesting thing with the photo, uh, which is that husband has gone to war. And a lot of these wartime photos, uh, the male is absent. He's off uh, doing the masculine thing. Jack. Yeah. I want to see that again. Look at that kid's arm. I can't. I can't see a hand on there. Uh, Is there a missing hand? Uh, so I think they are. I think that somebody's holding. Yeah. Huh? Somebody's holding his hand or something. 
Yeah. Sorry, it's a fuzzy picture. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's the case. All right, now, here we've got a um, man by the name of uh, Jay Prosser. Jay teaches at the uh, University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And these are his grandparents. And the thing to be said about grandparents, this is taken in Singapore about 10 days before the Japanese invasion. Uh, Grandpa, on our right, has fled uh, Iraq. He's an Iraqi Jew. Uh, grandma, on the far left, is uh, an illegal Chinese immigrant uh, to Singapore. And, of course, uh, Chinese were not allowed into Singapore without some kind of papers or visa. It looks like a good uh, family. They're all together. And, in fact, none of them had papers but they were keen to get out of Singapore because the Japanese invasion was about 10 days away. The uh, use of this photograph to establish their identity happily worked, uh, even though father, grandpa, and grandma were not married. The girl in the back was uh, a daughter of grandpa's first wife who died and these people did not actually get married till 1957 although the uh, foreground children were were theirs so the power of this family photograph is that first of all it misrepresents what's going on uh, and secondly, it was used as a document to get them out on uh, the, one of the last boats to leave because none of these categories would be uh, well treated by the Japanese and none of them were. The, the family photograph uh, really gets things together, but uh, and is a utilitarian document, but uh, it's only through some artifice. But they are looking normal, and times are very difficult here. There's a, a set of photographs uh, from an article uh, written uh, by a... Um, Professor Hirsch at uh, Columbia, and I'm just looking for the reference without any, uh, without any success. Yeah, Marianne Hirsch teaches at Columbia University. It's kind enough to let me use these photographs. And the question here is, uh, as Professor Hirsch puts it, here we have people performing their identities in public. There was in the town in which they lived a street photographer. He would take your photo as you pass by and uh, sell it, uh, sell the print to you, which he could do instantly, by the way, even in the 30s, would sell a print to you for uh, not very much. The uh, upper left uh, shows uh, her mom and sister on what uh, Professor Hirsch calls the um, assimilationist trajectory. They are Jews, but they are dressed in a nice way. Uh, they speak several languages. They're very cosmopolitan. And this is their identity. And that's a difficult identity to uh, let go of. So uh, as uh, the Nazis uh, blanketed Europe, uh, the next one is that these were not uh, 
people who were deported for reasons I don't think that uh, Professor Hirsch knows, but uh, they were, here they are with a public identity, the upper right, slide 13, uh, wearing the yellow star. So Where's they, the star? pardon? Where? Yeah, you can see it on, uh, with the person on the left, on the left thing, and, and on, it's a black uh, blot on the right. I'm sorry, the uh, qualities are not perfect. Um, I can see it here, but it's okay. Now, uh, if you want to keep doing your identity, then something strange happened. Uh, sometime later, you get the lower left photo where uh, what there is is a blotch. Somebody has doctored the photograph because that's, of course, uh, humiliating and derogatory to have to wear the yellow star. So there's a uh, removal of the yellow star and Professor Hirsch has kind of tried to blow this up and, you know, blown up at this size, it's not, uh, it's not terrific, but uh, you can see there's kind of a blotch. Uh, what uh, she calls this is the will to normality in times of extremity. You want to be seen uh, on the same trajectory you were before your group was identified and um, vilified and uh, beginning of uh, some substantial amount of atrocity. So, what we see in these photos in abnormal times is that people are trying to look normal. This is a Jewish wedding in Nazi Europe. And in this photograph, uh, you see people, you can see meta people wearing yellow stars. And uh, it's a Jewish wedding in Nazi Europe. And the story is, I think, that people tried very hard to keep uh, their, uh, what was in this case a tradition, although clearly not an Orthodox tradition, and even having to wear the yellow star, their thought was to uh, be as normal as possible. You have an issue with um, uh, degradation if you're part of the degraded people, uh, which is that there's a lot of circulation, as there was at this time, uh, of photographs of atrocity. So if you're the vilified people, uh, you're photographed uh, dead, wounded, blemished, and naked. Uh, Jay Prosser, whose slide we saw a little while ago, uh, is uh, beginning to write on atrocity and how atrocity uh, provides an uh, image of people that degrades them even more. So this is the reaction, even though uh, this couple was unlikely to survive, they did want to get married, the family did want to show that connection, um, and in terms of all photographs, as soon as you snap them being history, I think this couple was trying to say something, say something playing it forward, saying that uh, here we are, we hope we have a future. We are taking this photo as if we did have a future. We do plan to live. I think it, uh, the more you look at it, the uh, uh, more touched you get by this uh, photograph. So these are folks who did their best to look normal in abnormal times. Now there's a uh, serious conflict between those triumphalist photographs that we saw before and uh, 
the uh, idea of what families remember. Uh, I'll go with a little bit, a few editorial slides first. Uh, this is the this is the photo I had on my uh, poster, which uh, uh, people seem to like in some way. And of course, it's the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, the soldiers have rousted this family. I believe it's just after the ghetto uprising. Uh, and you can see that war is always a war on families. This family uh, is being, uh, well, they're, they're not going to live very long. This is not like the wedding photo. Uh, this is uh, Palestine, same photo. Another one, same photo. Um, and these are sh uh, pointing uh, machine guns at children, uh, I think, uh, is, uh, provides a graphic and <laughs> startling image. Uh, this is the Spanish Civil War, the best photographed war ever. Uh, you have three or four remarkable photographers. And um, the, image, the, the image that sticks with you from uh, this war, the war of Franco against the Republicans, uh, the duly elected government, uh, is that it's the first time there is terror from the air. And uh, Picasso's Guernica, which became the most celebrated photograph of most celebrated image of the 20th century shows that, but just an ordinary uh, photograph of people walking on the street at that time, it's about 1936, uh, looking up in the air, uh, hearing a buzz, uh, bombs may fall because uh, uh, the Franco uh, army is uh, supported by the Nazis. Lots of photographs that I won't show about uh, the warplanes, the bombers being loaded, heading off just to uh, bomb uh, the Republic out of existence. And you can catch the apprehensiveness in uh, that woman's face as she looks up and the distress of the child. Uh, this uh, is a soldier, his wife, uh, and their baby, uh, also from the Spanish Civil War, and they're hastening. There's a crowd. Uh, they're hastening to uh, get out of there. Uh, here's also an image uh, that's uh, very affecting of children, uh, parents uh, killed in some way, huddling on the street. And uh, there was a um, uh, project done some years ago. Uh, it's called uh, Dark is the Room Where We Sleep. It's a project uh, by uh, Francesc Torres. It was shown at the uh, International Center of Photography. Uh, and in uh, 1936, the armies of Franco broke through. They uh, assassinated 47 Spanish Republican men. Uh, they were in the village of Villa Mayor de los Montes. Uh, and they were buried in an unmarked mass grave. And they were not spoken of. Uh, they were remembered by the family. Uh, there was no culpability. There was no uh, recognition. Uh, like uh, many places, the, uh, uh, the soldiers who died were heroes. Uh, and the civilians who died were most times 
to be innocent civilians caught in the line of fire. But in fact, that's a bullet. That's a bullet taken from the archeological site of the graves. Uh, that's a bullet that killed the loved one. The loved one was not innocently caught in any crossfire at all. These are the relatives. And uh, in 2007, they were able to unearth uh, the um, graves. They were able to mourn. They were able to start talking about their relatives who had been killed because they remembered uh, that those sons and fathers and brothers had been with them, but uh, they weren't allowed to remember during the Franco era. You couldn't speak of that. Now this is uh, my family and the uh, relatives of uh, some of the people in the room. And uh, it's a family around um, 1925. And this, fa this picture hangs on my wall. And every day I look at it and I ask them, tell me something. And they don't speak. They're silent. And of course, many of the people from uh, that generation. Uh, they got out of Europe uh, in the 20s, early 30s. But many of the people from that generation and the children's generation, these were my aunts and uncle, uh, were silent. Uh, they didn't tell me anything. They didn't tell their relatives anything. I think our father never spoke of what had happened in, uh, in Europe during those years, uh, even though they, um, they were able to get out. But they died shortly after coming to Canada, the, the older generation in any case. So the issue is what can we get out of this uh, photograph? And you can't do that without some uh, collateral uh, understanding. First of all, this area of Poland that they're in had been taken over, had been formerly part of Russia, where they were able to live quite a, on the, quite a bit on the assimilationist trajectory. Once the uh, Poles became the government, they began passing anti-Semitic laws about uh, Jews holding property, Jews having certain occupations. Uh, and by, in the early 20s, still in the aftermath of the uh, victory, uh, they became uh, victims. Uh, my uh, best suggestion on this from another family member who's not here is that two older boys, who would have been my uncles, uh, were killed uh, in uh, one of the uh, programs early or middle of the 20s, sometime very soon after that. So I brought, uh, found uh, Nancy K. Miller, teaches at City University of New York. She has an article with a similar photograph. What do you ask of? these people, uh, what uh, does it uh, mean? And uh, so with uh, uh, some interest, she did some investigation, I did some too, to find out uh, actually the rate of suicide among Jews in this uh, era just doubled, tripled, it uh, became an epidemic. Uh, people mostly throwing themselves out of buildings. Uh, but uh, times became very terrible and the mental health of folks uh, deteriorated. So can we say that this Grimm family, still presenting as normal in the photograph of the time with the painted backdrop, uh, you can't see it that well here on the very large screen, 
Uh, but the, it was done with a professional eye, professional photograph. Uh, they're trying to present uh, as uh, a normal uh, crowd. The uh, thought is that those, uh, as I'm, those two older boys died under the following circumstance. Uh, first of all, uh, there were marauding armies. And here's what Nancy Miller got out of her family. Uh, Grandpa told us that when he was young, the Cossacks would come to their town and give the children a ride. At that point, they were very friendly. His dad, my grandfather, had a tobacco store, and I guess they were people of means. The very same men who gave them rides came through the town killing and looting. He used to say they came in the front door and he and his family fled through the back. In any case, they, they left uh, this part of the world uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, and there are other uh, descriptions of the rioting uh, of uh, people against the Jews. I have a good photograph of uh, the, what Kristallnacht looked like in this part of the world, not just in Hitler's Germany, which is much more, uh, uh, much more popular. Okay, well, uh, I think I've got another photograph of Chinese uh, child and his mother just after the end of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, should I just give a couple of words about that because uh, in fact, um, there, is, uh, there are a couple of sentences here that, in the account that may give, give us some hope. Uh, the years, uh, the, the, little, the little boy whose name happens to be Jack in English, uh, spoke of the time before he was born. Uh, is one of almost imaginable, unimaginable hardship and trauma. Now you see that mother and child are looking kind of normal here. Uh, it looks just like a regular baby picture. And there is the house in the background that makes it look very substantial. Uh, but in fact, the house was a communal place. Uh, she was from an aristocratic a well-connected family in one of the ethnic groups and was, of course, uh, sent to be um, re-educated. Uh, so here she is finally with her, uh, with her baby. Uh, the little boy, now much older, says, my mother would lie all her hopes on the baby. The baby's a son, which meant uh, quite a great deal to them. And also her feeling was that the baby is the future. Uh, people place more value on boys than girls uh, in this culture. Uh, the proudest possessions in my family uh, was Jack. He was the only child uh, of this marriage. And uh, mom said, uh, my son will grow up and become my hope. If every newborn child embodies renewal and hope for the future, the hope represented by the little boy in this picture is thoroughly and very distinctively overdetermined by its historical circumstances. So that's our image of hope. And it's uh, about enough for now.